Hello and welcome to this special edition of Planted Unearthed. My name's Sam Peters and I'm one of the co-founders of Planted, the first contemporary design event aimed at reconnecting people and spaces with nature. Now, here we are on Granary Square at uh, Planted's flagship launch event. I'm delighted to go to say it's been going fantastically well here so far. We've been blessed by wonderful weather and also blessed by some amazing partners and speakers at our Planted Unearthed Talks program. Now, one of those uh, speakers, panelists, who's just been on our Why Rewild talk has, uh, is Patrick Begg of the, uh, of the National Trust. Patrick, you're the lead on climate change and outdoors at the National Trust. Can you tell us a little bit about the role that you play? Oh, it's going to sound really grandiose, but I've got a, I've, I've got a really privileged job in that I, I look after all our strategy and our policy around our response to climate change, both uh, reducing our use of carbon and our emissions, but also adapting to the um, uh, the shocks that we know are coming with with climate change. I also lead our ranger community and our countryside management across 250,000 hectares of land that we look after, uh, and also. Uh, recently our new focus on bringing nature where people live urban green yeah. and i mean national trust has done some fantastic work in this space we've just been talking about rewilding specifically why rewild what rewilding is it was a fascinating conversation with some amazing speakers but really interested to hear from you what the national trust is doing in this space and 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 why you're doing it so rewilding has in the past been a bit of a loaded term, so it can get put people's backs up. Traditional land managers think it's a, it's a grab of their territory. And uh, I think we, we have a, a lot of the, the, the sort of toxic feel of that has gone out of the debate as we've realized that society needs more from its land. And a lot of it is around carbon. It's around uh, water, uh, slowing it down making it clean so we can drink it and that requires different types of land management so i think the debate has shifted for the trust we feel a very strong responsibility to public benefit that is why we were set up originally our founders were all about um, creating outdoor living rooms for the poor mm -hmm. and in a sense our new focus uh, our refocus on wildlife and the outdoors um, follows those founders vision mm -hmm. so we're uh, we're definitely in it for uh, change mm -hmm. so we think our land use does need to change across the country and we are our, our kind of uh, gift to the nation is is practical change so it isn't just about talking about it, it is we do it across yeah. our estate so we have all these hundreds of thousands of hectares of land which could be providing more for nature mm -hmm. so we are in the process of identifying the places which have headroom to mm -hmm. do that we've got some fabulous nature rich places already but we also have a lot of farmland that could do more mm -hmm. so we want to work with our tenants we want to create a sense of change uh, but we also want to find ways to make that economically sensible to do it uh, we talked on the on the panel about the commercial case for nature uh, and the fact that as you just alluded to uh, rewilding can be in some cases quite a um, polarizing topic um, I think we all agreed that we need to bring people with us in the conversation. What's the National Trust doing to um, enable this change to happen in a way that, that doesn't alienate and divide? Yeah, so uh, two or three things probably to say on that, Sam. Um, the first thing is we do apply our brains to it and look at what's happening around us, take practice and make it into policy suggestions. And we do research to understand how that might work. So we've done quite a lot in recent times around water Mm -hmm. It's uh, to use the lingo, it's the closest to market around crowding in some of the corporate and private finance that we think's out there that can pay for some of this change. And it will give land managers a new string to their bow in terms of a business model. Mm -hmm. So, for example, it will cost substantially less for water companies, private entities, um, to pay farmers and land managers to um, make more naturalized land use in the, at the top of a catchment where the water falls and then comes down the hill to put trees back in those places, um, to, to take some of the more damaging um, arable uh, management that we have in the uplands um, and just uh, um, soften and, and create the, the, the sponge that used to be in place there. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, we're very keen because it's so much cheaper to pay for that rather than for a water company build another um, treatment plant at the bottom of the catchment which has to strip out all the phosphates and nitrates that go into the land management that used to be there. Mm -hmm. So there is a business case to pay people to do that. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it makes completely economic sense mm -hmm. to pay um, our land managers and our farmers to do something different which mm -hmm. also delivers for nature. One of the things I think most people were interested in in the, uh, the talk that we've just had was the some of the statistics that you had 
to hand and they were very readily tripped off the tongue. But um, can you give some some data that, and some of the research that you guys have done, uh, which makes the commercial case for re-enabling nature? We, yeah, we can. And, and this is very city based, so it's very, you know, very appropriate for, for today's event. Um, so we're in the middle of London, um, but we've we've done some work, uh, and, and it sort of divides itself really simply. So first of all, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Well, we've identified by working with Vivid Economics, a, a very pucker firm using methodologies that the Treasury would recognise for how government spends its money. We've identified 295 boroughs in England that are nature deprived, so they don't have access to nature. And at the same time, you overlay those with the impacts of COVID, dread, dreadful impacts and public health and people's physical and mental well-being um, they map together so they are the same places yeah. so there is a very compelling um, argument for looking at what are the economics that will allow us to address those two problems mm -hmm. and they're really good so there are three things that we can do the first one is we could um, green up our gray streets and that's a sort of um, corridors and connectivity question mm -hmm. we're just bringing back trees and greenery into our currently concrete clad gray neighborhoods along streets would make a huge difference. And with Vivid's help, we've found that for every pound of public money that could be spent doing that, you would be able to get back seven pounds of benefit. So that's the first one. The second one um, is to invest in our parks and green spaces that are already there. So they are generally people, you know, they sneer at things and say, well, that feels very municipal. Well, that kind of brings to mind something, doesn't it? Well, actually, we could change that and we could really make our parks nature rich. We could bring back the sense of wildlife spaces um, and we could also enable people and social enterprises to thrive around that. Provision of cafes, um, cycling, hire, all the kind of things that would make it an active space that people want. Uh, and again, the, the and, and, and the investment case for that is super compelling. So for every pound that, of public money that would go into that, you get a hundred pounds back. That is a big piece of leverage. Yeah. And then the final bit is what we do with the land that immediately encircles our towns and cities. Uh, so we have green belts. They've been really helpful. They've stopped bad things happen, mm -hmm. but they're one trip pony. So they only really stop stuff. They don't enable the development of nature, um, give people a destination they could go to, to recreate and all those kinds of things. We could invest for every pound in regional parks that encircled our towns and cities, we get three pounds back. Mm. Not as heroic, but still worth having. Mm. Aggregate all that up. We reckon there's 5.5 billion pounds of public money that could be invested to get 200 billion pounds of public benefit back. I think that's a case that's pretty compelling. It certainly is a very compelling case and something that we hope it planted that people higher up in, the, in government listen to, because I think those of us who love nature and see the opportunities here really can make this commercial case. And um, just a couple more questions, if I may, Patrick, just around the National Trust working around this association between poverty and, and lack of access. Can you talk a little bit about that lack of access to nature, of course, I mean, um, can you talk a little bit around the, the work you guys have done there? Yeah, so we've been, we've been thinking very much about system change. So I think, you know, everyone imagines, and it's true that the National Trust is very place-based. So we, we own places, we keep them special, and we look after them in perpetuity. Uh, and, and they're on everyone's holiday list. Of course, we're place-based, but we've started to operate beyond our boundaries. And this is an exact case in point where we've worked for the last um, five years in partnership with the National Lottery Heritage Fund uh, on what we call our Future Parks Accelerator. And that was recognizing uh, in that second part of the previous case I made for investment that our parks were on their knees and, and we can't look to local government and it just doesn't have the resources or time, bandwidth, money. Mm -hmm. Um, to invest and manage parks. So we recognise that there was a need to reimagine in governance, um, allow more actors to come into that space. Uh, and we had expertise, curatorial, nature conservation, how you make money out of catering, <laughs> you know, all those things that we could bring to bear to it. And we've worked with local authority teams in some targeted cities, 10 in, uh, across the UK, to imagine how we might recreate uh, governance around our parks so that they could get back into some kind of financial sustainable management but also give power back to local communities so they felt that they were parks for them mm -hmm. co-create fashionable term but yeah. it really works if you get it right mm. it's really fascinating and i mean if i just obviously ask you about um, why you're here at planted today and, and what it is about planted in this particular event that feels like the right place for the national trust to be well I, you know um, so I, I look around where we're sitting, Sam, and I see a, a big investment in, in, in a 
previously very deprived and down at heel bit of London around King's Cross, transformed in 20 years, but it's still not quite there. Mm -hmm. So I look around and I see, you know, large areas of, of paving. Um, I don't see as much green as we might, and it's been compartmentalized. And I think you guys have spotted that there is, uh, there is actually some big leaps still to be made in what civic change looks like and getting it right. So it is about the design principles that you espouse, uh, but it's also the ability to mobilize a network. Mm -hmm. So unless we do both of those things, get the design right, so mm -hmm. we know what the recipe book looks like and be ambitious around it, but also activate people who can really make a difference locally mm -hmm. and get people to want the change that, that, that you're talking about. Oh, that's fantastic. It certainly chimes with us. It's been an absolute pleasure having you, not just on the Talks panel, also speaking to you now on Plant Planted on Earth, Patrick. Patrick Babe from the National Trust, thank you for your time. Thank you, Sam. Thank you.